1 Corinthians 15 says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, and He appeared to more than 500 brothers. That's how Paul sees the resurrection. Paul, if ever, uh, shares the gospel, it always includes the resurrection. The resurrection is, in fact, what makes Christianity, Christianity. We were home recently, and we got to go up and visit my dad. I hadn't seen him uh, since probably before COVID. I remember you guys praying for his wife, who was 70 days in a coma and came out and uh, actually, she attributes the prayers that we did here to her waking up and, and being alive today. But given that, um, he gave me a family heirloom while I was there. And uh, if you're old as I am, um, we used to not have cameras on phones. We used to have cameras that you had to hold around. And we also had this really cool thing back in the 70s called 8 millimeter films. All right. And uh, so he handed me a box of probably a hundred eight millimeters fil films from my childhood. And uh, I, I remember one specifically. I haven't gotten to view them yet, but I, I know this one is in there. And it's when I'm living on Midway Island, uh, island out in the middle of the Pacific. It's 500 people. It's a mile long at its longest, really small island. Uh, but. We were, we were in the sand dunes, and my sister and I were rolling down the sand dunes, just continuously going back, running up the hill, and rolling down. The cool thing about 8 millimeter films is that all you have to do, because it's being shown through a light, is hit reverse. And all of a sudden, you're rolling up backwards on, on the films. And we did exactly that. We laughed, and we played those films probably all of my childhood life. Uh, forwards and backwards, forwards and backwards, and the memories, the memories. Easter for the believer is just like that. We remember. Young teachers, pastors will come up to me and say, how do you make it interesting year after year? And I'm like, you don't have to. You tell the story. It's the most important day in the church calendar and it's yet the easiest Sunday of all because all we have to do is sit here and roll the film. Rewind it. Roll the film. We've been studying through the uh, Upper Room Discourse, which made this Easter even easier because we just continued after John 17 and kept walking our way through the Passion Week. And then last Friday, if you were here for our wonderful uh, Good Friday service, the, the music team did such a great job. Um, we read through the crucifixion. And Friday night, that's where we stopped. And so today, all I'm going to do is really read through um, John 20 and 21, part of 21, not the whole thing, and just give some notes. Maybe just stop and rewind, back up, and look at it again. Just so that we, as a family, can keep the memory. So the crucifixion has happened. There were two men that we saw on Friday that showed up to do the burial. Obviously, men are, are not going to do that too well. So the next day, Mary has already prepared to come in and correct it after, after the Passover. And so she's there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early. We see in other Gospels that she has brought again the embalming things with her. While it was still dark, she got up. She was ready. She was waiting for the first moment that she could go. Because this was her Lord. This was her Lord's body. And though she didn't understand the death, she couldn't make upside down, right side up of that. She knew that she needed to tend her Lord's body. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, so she ran and went to Simon Peter. She got there, and the tomb was open. 
Nobody would have beaten her there. She doesn't give any thought that she looked in. She just knows something has been tampered with. And so she goes to her leader, Simon Peter, and the other disciple, which we know to be John, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So on top of a grief-stricken Friday, on top of a silent Saturday where even though we call it Silent Saturday, I think God was probably doing things in their hearts and in their minds that 24, 36 hours. They've taken the Lord. She didn't get it. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb, and both of them were running together, and just like guys to mention this, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. So John's a little faster. He's going to mention it again later if you don't think he's bragging. Uh, I, I don't know why else he would mention what the speed of John versus Peter matters in this text. But John wins. And stooping to look in, John, he saw the linen cloths lying there. Uh, the, the Greek is a little bit more descriptive here, that, that the cloths were just laying in the position of where the body had been left. Then Simon Peter came, and oh, impetuous Peter, uh, he doesn't stop. He goes into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth, and this is why it matters how the Greek said, which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up in a place by itself, that somebody had meticulously taken it and placed it in such a way that there was something involved here. Though the rest looked like, who knows, we'll find out that, he just came through it, probably. But the face cloth was taken and folded and put separately. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. And this is the point. You're going to see throughout the book of John in all 21 chapters that these things, it's going to mention it here in just a little bit, these things are written so that we might know, we might believe. The whole purpose of the Gospel of John is to present the argument of Jesus for belief. And you're going to see this waking up, and it's kind of like, uh, I didn't sleep good too well last night. Uh, usually I'm up just two minutes. I don't know how it happens, but my body always knows two minutes before the alarm goes off, I wake up. But this morning, the alarm went off, which is usually a bad sign. And so groggily, I kind of wake myself up and get out. And, and, and all these people involved are going to kind of get it little by little by little, and probably even into the book of Acts, their understanding more and more of the gospel of grace much like you and I. When I go home and someone says, hey, do you remember when you taught me and I've lived here for 17 years? So that means it was at least probably two decades ago that I taught whatever they're speaking about. And I just cringe because I'm like, ooh, what could I possibly have said at such a young age that it had any correctness at all? Um, but we wake up. God sanctifies. God allows us to realize Mostly, I think, as we're able, as we're able to take it in. He believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So what did John believe? I don't know. What kind of sense did he make out of it? I don't know, but I think he had a hope all of a sudden that those rags, those death cloths did not get stripped off. If somebody had taken the body... That would have been 75 extra pounds, as we saw in the last chapter, of embalming materials. They would have ripped through that and taken that body out. But it looks like the body just evaporated. And the disciples go back to their homes, probably scratching their head. But Mary, and we see this throughout the New Testament, women are given very distinct representation. 
Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And after the two disciples had left, there were two angels in white. How'd they get in there? Sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Which, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a funeral, but that seems to be the last statement you would ever make at a funeral. I was in Ethiopia recently, and what they do is they have these tents that every neighborhood has, and a funeral was going on between where I was staying and where I was doing my work. And I had to walk by it several times in one day. And what they do is much like what they would do back then, is that they would gather in a home, and those who had lost would sit there, and people would just come throughout the day. And usually nothing was said, because there is nothing to say. Maybe a hug, maybe a few words, but then you would just sit. And you would sit. And they were doing this in Ethiopia all day long. This poor grieving woman, and people would join her, and they would weep with her. But here, he's saying, why are you weeping? Angels. Maybe not real, lots of empathy, but they, they know their theology. You shouldn't be weeping. Why are you weeping? And matter-of-factly, Mary says, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. She's still concerned. She almost seems like me, task-oriented, overlooking all the details. I just came to do a task, and I need to get this task done. If you'll tell me where the body is, I will go prepare it. Just tell me what I need to know. The problem is she doesn't know what she needs to know, does she? Having said this, she turned around and she sees Jesus, but much like maybe on the road to Emmaus where he didn't allow himself to be known to the disciples walking there, Mary doesn't see who he is. Jesus said to her, woman, same question, why are you weeping? Just to bring her attention to what's going on. And then the second question, whom? Whom are you seeking? Who are you seeking, Mary? Supposing him to be the gardener, bad misidentification there, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, so to Jesus, Hey, Jesus, if you've carried Jesus away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. I will, I will recover him from you. I will recover you from you. And Jesus said to her, Mary. John 10, 3 says that he calls each of his sheep, knows each of his sheep by name. And as soon as he says it, she says, Rabboni, teacher. This is a really uh, well-debated set of verses that follow here. I, I tend to try to keep it simple when it seems they're making too much. Why can't, why can't she cling? Why can't she touch? That's the big theological debate. I don't think it's a matter that she's touching him as much as the way she's touching him. And it doesn't give the description there, but he says, do not cling to me. Mary, we know, likes to hold on to his feet. Mary likes to, uh, you know, be down and subordinate and giving him all reflection of who he is. And I, I bet she was doing something like that, either grasping him, holding his feet, doing something. And he says, I have not yet ascended to the Father. And all he's saying is, hey, it's not over yet. Don't cling to me here because there's still another step. We're, we're moving on. And then he uses a phrase which I think helps describe that, that there's this transition going on because he used to always call the disciples his friends. And now he says, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God, that, that we're on this pathway, which I told you. I told you I would rise from the dead. I told you I would descend to the Father. I told you I would be the first of the resurrection and that you will follow me, and we're just moving along. And Mag Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he said these things to her. So just stop and pause here. The Bible sometimes gets criticized for being 
a little misogynic or whatever, but she was the recipient of four special graces. She got to see the angels. She got to see the risen Jesus first. She was the first to see him alive, and she was the first to proclaim the good news, he has risen. The other two, they knew he wasn't there. But she gets the full revelation, he is alive. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. I mean, they took the one who did all these supernatural, miraculous things. They took the one who taught with such authority. They took the one who claimed to be God himself. How will they not come for me? Jesus came, though, in the midst of that fear and stood among them and said to them, Peace. And you're going to see this repeated at least three times in this particular gospel. Peace be with you. Proof gives peace. And the proof is, here I am. Here I am. There's been several lawyers, several philosophers, several people who have gone to disprove um, the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. And when they come to these original records and they walk through both the biblical and the extra biblical texts that talk about Jesus, the historical Jesus, they say we have enough facts to take this to court and win the case that Jesus was here, that Jesus was alive. And if he was, then he was most definitely who he said he was, the one who would come and die and rise and ascend to the Father. Peace be with you. If you haven't found that peace, Easter's a great day to find it. Today is the acceptable day for your salvation, the Bible says. And all it is is just like John, just like Mary, is to believe, to believe that Jesus is, Jesus did what he claims to have done. And I know that sounds simple, it's not. It's actually not. The belief might be simple, but the working out of that is the most exciting 40 years I've had. And it's not simple. When he had said this, he showed them his hands. There were other people who had been crucified. He could have shown them the feet. Um, but he shows them his side because that was uniquely Jesus. That we saw the crucifixion on Friday night and, and the soldier who had done this thousands of times probably, they, they crucified people all the time, that they would usually fade away, they would start losing consciousness, they would usually just die you know, after six, eight hours of hanging there. But Jesus didn't lose his senses in the end it apparently was him saying, it's over. He, he, he cried out, it is finished, and then he passed. And the centurion said, this is unlike anything I have ever seen. Unlike it. And so when they came to break the other two's legs to finish them off because they were still breathing, you can't breathe with broken legs because that was your means of breathing, was pushing up on the spike between your bones in your feet. They came to Jesus, realized he was dead, they put a spear in him and out came water. And so here's my side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. They too have seen the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace, second time, be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And this text is uh, one of the top texts of my life. It's, to me, it's a description of the causality of what Jesus has done and how we have become likened to him. And through the disciples, he is sending them forward to do the job that he has left them to do. And Acts is going to say they turned the world upside down, which they had. But then they turned over the gospel to the next and to the next and to the next generation until it came to my doorstep. And I think we can all personally read this 
as the Father has sent Jesus, and he sent the disciples, and they sent the next generation, 2 Timothy 2, 2, and the next, and the next, and the next, that has come to us. And for those who have believed, then we are supposed to be in gear with that sending, seeing, believing, and telling, that we are to take the cards that Doug has made and hand them out and invite people in and have people over for dinner and tell the greatest story that's ever been told, that salvation has come through a risen Savior. And that's when Christianity gets fun. When you start putting your name on the line for his name. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit comes. Whether or not this is John's account of Acts 2, I tend to not think so. Whether or not this was a partial, I don't know. But in some way, they were then empowered to go forward. That they were, again, waking up to the power that had come within them. That If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. So if you put all these parts together, I am sending you. I'm not sending you to do something that I'm not making you capable of. So here is the power of the Spirit. And with that power, you are now able to go tell people this message so that they can be forgiven of sin. Verse 21 to 23 is enough for us to get our great commission from. Peace be with you. I'm sending you. You go and tell. You need to be empowered to do that. Here is the Spirit. Go. Go. For all who have believed. The privilege of announcing heaven's terms on how a person can receive forgiveness is for the believer in Jesus Christ. A Christian has the right, the prerogative, the privilege to announce his forgiveness. If a person rejects Jesus, then they reject his forgiveness. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. I can so see me and Thomas. But he said to them, unless I see the hands, I'm not trusting you guys. This is a big deal. It's a big deal. I knew other Christians when I was 16, but I just thought they were kind of fluky, flaky. I had to go see. I had to go touch. I had to go hear for myself. I need more than your word for proof. I need a personal experience, which just like the calling of Mary by name, Jesus will give you that. I promise you. He will. Unless I see, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you, third time. The presence of Jesus is meant to give us peace in all situations. This was not a peaceful moment for them. They were in slight terror, wondering what was next. Then, specifically to Thomas, and we'll see next week with Peter, specifically to Thomas, he says, put your finger here. See my hands, put out your hand, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen Blessed are those, speaking of us, who have not seen yet and believed. Because though we will not see Jesus the way Thomas saw him, we will see much more in things that we have been given, in his word, in the change of hearts of millions. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that... John gives you his purpose statement right here, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. 
that Jesus is the Messiah, the hoped for from of old, that the Jews crucified. Jesus is the Son of God. He's claiming equality with Him. And if you believe in what He says about Himself, what He has done, who He is, that belief gives you life. This next section, I could have waited for next week, but I felt like it pushed up more than it pushed down. So I may come back to this a little bit next week. But after this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. If you remember the predict- his self-prophecy, he told them, I, hey, I'm going to meet you in Galilee. But he hasn't seen them in Galilee. The Sea of Tiberias is in Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. So it's another appearance specifically for his disciples. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. What were they doing? What were they doing? And Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Out of Jerusalem, back home. Okay, he's risen. Now what? We still don't have him with us. We don't have our leader. We're kind of wandering around here. We don't really get how the pieces all fit together. I'm going back to what I know. I'm going to go fishing. And like any good leader, they follow him and they say, we will go with you. And so he's going out to do what they're used to doing. And they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing because they weren't supposed to be fishers of fish anymore. They were supposed to be fishers of men. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? He knows the answer. No, no. Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. They've been fishing all night long. Just throw it right off the right. They're 100 yards from the shore, so they're probably already working their way in. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul in the net because of the quantity of fish. He provides an abundance of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, so John gets it again, it is the Lord. It's Jesus. And Simon, impetuous Simon, as always, heard that it was the Lord. And You can just see him ripping off, putting on, getting ready, and jumping into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, this will come back next week, and this is why we may back up a little bit. This scenario is kind of three days ago. This is early morning. It's the only other place in the entire Bible that a charcoal fire is mentioned outside of where Peter does the denial. And we'll play that in next week, but not this. But this would have been a memory. With fish laid out on it and bread, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So he's already got fish. He's asking for some that they caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. Now, if you want to really find some ridiculous commentaries, this is the place. Why 153? Because there were a lot, okay? And it's bragging rights for John again, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why 153. Um, I've seen everything from it's the number of species of fish in the Sea of Galilee (laughs) to it's some Kabbalistic number that means this, that, or whatever. I don't know. There may be an answer because it's a detail. Or it may just be showing that this is real. We're not just making this up. You know the guys are going to count the fish. And here it is. And all there, there were so many, the net was not torn. I don't know. Maybe every fisherman knows that the net tears at 150. I don't know. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. And none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew. They knew it was the Lord. And at some point in your progress, in your sanctification, 
you get it. You get that these circumstances, these happenstances, these things that you pray about and all of a sudden happen, you start connecting the dots. Like my dad's wife, Linda, who at 70 days wakes up, hears that there are prayers, and she says, oh my gosh, maybe there's something to this. But as believers, we see it all the time. We see him answer the small and the large. And sometimes that answer is no, we get it. But they didn't have to ask, who are you at this point? They were about to go take on the world for knowing who he was. And Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And thus saith the word of God. For I delivered to you as a first importance, Paul says, what I also received that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, just like it has been told, 300 prophecies coming to pass in the life and death of Jesus Christ that expand across 4,000 years, 15 to 30 authors all coming down to this one man with such specificity. And then to call out your death, the way you're going to die, and that you're going to rise from the dead. For me, I'm going to follow the one who rose. Who told us that he would, and he did. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas, to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive when Paul was writing this. He says, go ask them. Go ask them. There's verifiable witnesses here. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. I like that verse. One untimely born. That's me. I didn't get to walk with him. I didn't get to sit with him. I didn't get to have his fish breakfast on that morning. But I have walked with him. I have talked with him. And we have fellowshiped because Jesus, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Paul goes on, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We were even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. That without the resurrection, we have no Christianity. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. This is all out of 1 Corinthians 15. I didn't make slides here, but you can go look it up on your own. And he ends here, and it'll be my end. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, all men are in sin, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. All men who believe will live. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at the coming, those who belong to Christ, see Thessalonians. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority. It's the tapes. It's the film. We watch it and we see it go forward. We can rewind it and we can see it again 
and again and again. Easter for the believer is just like that. Remembrance. Remembrance of who he is, what he said, what he did, and that he has invited us to do it with him. Our last application will be communion. And again, all those who believe in Christ by faith, feel free. For those who have yet to get there, that's fine. Sit and watch a family that remembers the film, a family that rehearses in a token of remembrance, a bread that represents his life and a cup that represents his blood, the life that lived perfectly without sin and the blood that put that perfect life into a sacrificial place so that he would take on sin for us.